Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Source Material. I am your host, Jesse Starcher, and this evening we're going to be heading back to the 90s. That's right, one of my favorite times in the comic book. So, some might call it the unspoken decade. Hey, uh, hey, that's uh, right, as a matter of fact. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Mark Radlich with the uh, plug there for our good buddies over at the unspoken decade. I'll tell you right now, I'm a contributor, and I posted the cover of the, I think it was the fourth issue of this series, which we're going to be talking about tonight. And ladies and gentlemen, that series is... 1994 1994's Dark Horse Comics Barb Wire and here to tell us why in the hell did we pick Barb Wire to talk about on the Source Material podcast his name is Mark Radlitz the patriarch of the Radlitz and Broadcasting Network Mark tell 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 him Mark <laughs> well well uh, <laughs> I have a podcast uh, show on the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network called On Trial. Uh, I co-host it with my good buddy Sean Comer. We used to do a podcast called Long Road to Ruin, where we would look at the ups and downs of franchises. And then we decided that I didn't want to be spending my weekends watching nine hours worth of movies anymore. So we decided to switch the show to something called On Trial, as I said before. And that takes one, we take one movie... One of us prosecutes the movie, the other, the other one defends the movie, as if we were in a court of law. Now, sometimes I let Sean pick, sometimes we do something based on whatever the new release is in the cinemas, and other times I pick something from a grab bag of crap yeah. that no one would find <laughs> defensible. Nobody. I, I essentially take pe- I essentially find the uh, equivalent of the guy standing over the victim with the knife saying, I killed her, and saying, I'll defend you. <laughs> <laughs> and in that case, with that said, I have been looking for movies that were based on comic books, and there's more than you think out there, that we could do an on-trial for and then subsequently do a do the comic in which it was based on. This week, right here on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network, we've got a pair of shows. We're going to do the Barbed Wire 1994 <laughs> run, and then Sean and I are going to prosecute and defend. I'll be defending because I always, you know, I always take these winners. Easy winner cases. I will be defending the Pamela Anderson vehicle, really the movie that launched her acting career, <clears throat> mm. Barb Wire. Hmm. Well, okay. Uh, I don't know how much of that statement is true, but uh, you know, <laughs> I know you're going to be doing two some shows. Successful shows. Yeah, I was going to say Baywatch and. One successful show and one show. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, Ronnie Adams, Barbed Wire. Oh, do you remember this hitting the shelves, and were you interested? What What was your thought mm. originally when Barbed Wire was out there in the 90s? I only knew of the movie. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that this was a book. No kidding. Until after, you know, the movie hit uh, the theaters. Well, I knew of Dark Horse Comic because they did um, Star Wars. Yeah. And um, I knew of them, but I didn't know many of the titles, so... Mm-hmm. Barbed wire was one I wasn't really aware of. Okay. I I was just talking here earlier about how I remember Comics Greatest World hitting the shelves, uh, and there was a lot of a lot of crossing over uh, with each other during that period of time and I'm pretty certain I got the first run of those comics which was the 1993 I got some of them I should say uh, the mm. 1993 releases of X Ghost oh my goodness I can't remember some of the other titles that were going on in 1993 during that but it continued and went into 1994 and here we have a whole other host of titles doing the same thing uh, with Dark Horse uh, it's titled Comics Greatest World, but this one was Barb Wire, uh, which focused on a female-led lady by the name of Barb Pata- Kapa- Kapetsky. Excuse me, Barb Kapetsky. Uh, can, I, uh, can I interject here? You guys are scoffing at her film career. First of all, it's quite lengthy. Oh. Second of all, did you know that she was the voice of Stripperella, uh, aka Erotica Jones, for the entire 13-episode run? Of, Unfortunately, yeah. Of Stripperella? Yes, I did know <laughs> yes. that, actually. I, I, somehow I did know that. What, what other stuff has she done? Well, uh, Other than Tommy Lee. Her. <laughs> <laughs> that had to come up at some point. <laughs> uh, welcome to Boomtown. All right. Um, well, let's just look at a couple of her films here. Uh, uh, she was in Baywatch the movie for Hidden, uh, Forbidden Paradise. 
Yeah. She was in Baywatch. That was an Emmy Award winner. That was was made for TV. She she was in Baywatch White Thunder at Glacier Bay. Okay, can we we just strike all Baywatch movies off of the table, please, and tell us what else she starred in? Uh, Well, she plays herself in the 2002 Scooby-Doo. Okay. She plays herself in Borat. I've never seen it. She plays the Invisible Girl in Superhero Movie. <laughs> she was Jennifer Mary in Hollywood and Wine. No. Uh, she was in the most recent Baywatch as older yes. CJ. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, now, if you go over to her television roles, she was at the Royal Rumble in 1995, and then she was at WrestleMania 11, and she You're played reaching, herself. You're reaching, dude. <laughs> You're reaching. <laughs> she, uh, she, I said she was the lead role in the, all 13 episodes of Stripperella. Let's see. She did a show called VIP, too. Yeah, my uncle worked on that. It was terrible. Oh. Um, it was a horrible movie. Dude. I think. Show. I, I was going to say, I think. I'm gonna have, is that like a. a um, a detective agency of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Three yeah. Le- yeah. she's the lead role. She had she was in eighty eight episodes. That thing lasted for four years. Holy cow! Cow, that was a pile of shit. I remember the only reason I remember this is Angry Video Game <laughs> Nerd did a review on the video game, the PlayStation video game, based off no. of that show. And I it think, was the I most. Think, it was the shitty game. I mean, I very. think Jesse and I need to do an entire TV party tonight on this series. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I would get it. I'm sure I could steal it somehow, but I have I have no desire to even attempt. This is not a joke. I love how I knew what the show was and offered up that information, and he automatically goes, "I think Jesse and I." <laughs> I, I think that's amazing. The only reason is because he knows I would hate it most likely. Exactly. Uh huh. <laughs> Bastard. Uh, she was also a she was also a lead role in Home Improvement for twenty three episodes. I lead as Lisa. Are you, are, are she was lead? the she was the uh, girl that introduced them uh, on the she TV was a show. Tool girl. Yeah, she was yeah. a tool girl. I, yeah, lead. I don't lead know. Role. That's stretching it. <laughs> Lead. Uh, lead, lead role. What do you sure. ask, dude? She's been working, man. All she, right. she, she had stuff in 2017 in both film and TV. So you know, like I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from her. She's really one of the great, uh, great heroin actors of our time. Okay, all right. Well, I speaking won't... of heroin, you need to stop taking it <laughs> because it's making you delusional, man. <laughs> well, so can I, can I read you her awards? Oh, please. <laughs> <These are> great. <laughs> Um, well, she won an award. She uh, she won a Golden Apple Award. Uh, the Sour Apple is what she won in 1997. I assume that that's for some kind of I shitty don't performance. I know what that is, but I'm sure she deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was she won for worst new star. Uh, she won a Raspberry for Barbed Wire, uh, the the uh, the movie that will be on trial tomorrow, and the comic that we're talking about tonight. But she was also nominated for Worst Actress and Worst sc- <laughs> worst Screen Couple, which apparently the, uh, the, the the couple is her and her, quote, th- this is right off the wiki, her impressive enhancements. Oh, ah. c- what? <laughs> so, <laughs> I understand that, but oh, yeah, that, that award show um, was in a Okay. So she, won, she was nominated for Best Female Television Star for an Otto Award. In 94 for Baywatch, and then she was nominated again in 1995. Uh, she was nominated for Best Actress for an Otto Award uh, in 1996 for Barbed Wire. And Wait. I don't understand this. So, Oh, no, okay, it's two different awards. Award? And then she, uh, Bravo Otto Award. So some dude made these up. <laughs> she was nominated in 1996 for the Stinker's Bad Movie Award for Worst Actress for Barbed Wire. Oh, my goodness. And, and she was nominated oh, for a number of raspberries. Just mean. I understand the Razzies, but that one's just hard. This, is, this might be my favorite one. She was uh, nominated for a Stinker's Bad Movie Award in the category of Most Distracting Celebrity Cameo Appearance for Scooby-Doo in 2002. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> I think... And, and for Stacked, she was nominated for a Teen Choice Award for Choice TV Actress in a Comedy. Okay, what, what comedy? comedy does it have it listed there? Stacked. The, oh, for Stacked. Stacked. Oh, okay, got it. Oh, yeah, that... 
that one. I that was a USA almost like near up all night kind of deal, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Came on or at least was in the same rotation as Weird Science was uh, in the evenings. I think you guys should recognize the theatrical I'm talent. Sure I'll tell you. Thing. I'll tell you what, Mark Radlich, we're going to let you do that. Come <laughs> the night you, you say barbed wire on trial. Did you say I'm natural putting, talent? Uh, I, theatrical, that's what I said. Oh, I thought you said natural. I was going to say there ain't nothing natural about it. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure her hep C is natural. Aside from this horrible movie that we've decided to talk about for the last 15 minutes, <laughs> my expectations going into this comic book were probably... You know, they were probably affected by the reception of the film because I thought what we, what I have heard that the film was, I've never seen Barbed Wire, but I knew Pamela Anderson was in it. I knew that there was probably some TNA involved, and you know, I, I didn't, I, or I, I didn't expect much different in the comic, and it, it turns out I was pleasantly surprised. And we'll talk about that as we go through the series here. Either way, let's talk about the creators, uh, the uh, the creators of this comic book. Now, from what I understand. Uh, Barb Wire is she's created by Chris Warner in 1994. This series that we're actually going through is not her first appearance. She was uh, she was previously in a couple other comics, uh, Dark Horse comics prior to this. But this is kind of like the main series, and we're going to be covering nine issues tonight. Uh, and what the way we're going to do it, I probably should have told you guys this before we got on here, but I'm going to break it down into three sections. Uh, I'm going to summarize issues one through three. We'll talk about whatever issues four and five, which is the story about the machine, and then issue. The four, the last four issues, six, seven, eight, and nine, which I'm just going to call Ignition Quest, uh, because it mainly focuses around uh, Barb and her running with Ignition near the end. So, the writer of this story, as we go through it, the main writer, all the way up to like issue eight, is John Arcudi, which we've talked about him. Me and Good Stephen Marsh did a Aliens versus Predator episode on on that writer. Uh, so John Arcudi writes the first eight issues of this series, and then Anita Bennett comes in for the ninth and final issue, along with Paul Guinan. Now, the artists are all over the place. we got a guy by the name of Lee Motor, Dan Lawless, which I think he does issues two and three, four and five. Uh, then Mike Manley steps in for six and seven. Uh, then Andrew Robinson for issue eight, and Robert Walker for issue nine. So... Let's get into the story here. We'll talk about what happens in these first three issues. Talk about our main character. And I'll synopsis this. Then you guys just hop in. And uh, we'll, we'll have any talking points that you guys want to bring up. So here we go. Steel Harbor. It's a city very representative of its name. It's a hard, unforgiving place to live. But Barb Kopetsky, otherwise known as the toughest nails bounty hunter Barb Wire, puts her skip trace skills to use, making a living nabbing those who skipped out on bail. Not only that, she also runs a local bar in town called The Hammerhead. She does this with the assistance of her brother, the brilliant blind mechanic Charlie, her super-powered bar bouncer Frank Fletcher, or otherwise known as Motorhead, and Avram, Ro- Avram, try again, Avram Roman, the government-created cyborg called The Machine. Now, the first three issues find Barb trying to track down uh, an assassin by the name of Death Card that has killed one of her recent suspects as she was attempting to bring him in. When her contact tells her that the real money is a- actually in apprehending superpowered fugitives, Barb plans to make a play to nab a guy uh, by the name of Hurricane Max. Uh, Barb convinces Max to try to trap Death Card and then turn himself in. But unfortunately, Max betrays her and attempts to flee. But luckily, with the help of her friend, a hulking cyborg named Machine, she is able to apprehend him. But Death Card escapes. During all of this, we are treated to a gang leader by the name of Mace Blitzkrieg. Well, these are some names. Mace Blitzkrieg and his, his assault on the police of Steel Harbor, which unfortunately does not get resolved in this series. If you want to check out what happens at the end of this this uh, this story, check out Will to Power number four. Uh, however, we do get the origin of a very important character of this series, a person by the name of Ignition. Uh, we see the original Ignition, uh, who was a guy who's a guy in a hospital bed and his crazy, he has his crazy girlfriend by his side. Now when his girlfriend snaps and kills him in a jealous rage, this poor guy, he's just laying there 
He's dead to the world, and she's jealous because a nurse comes in and checks on him, and I think barbed wire leaves there, and she just snaps, kills this guy in a jealous rage. The power that made Ignition, who he was, then uh, transfers to his girlfriend's body, and we have the new incarnation of Ignition. Ignition 2, apparently that's what it's called in, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the wiki, Ignition 2. And at the end of this arc, we see Ignition teaming with the gang leader Mace Blitzkrieg to wreak havoc amongst the, amongst the city and attack uh, Steel Harbor's police forces. That's it. That's the end of the first three issues. So here's our introduction of Barbed Wire. Now, Ronnie, I kind of talked about my expectations going into this. Uh, what were your expectations and, and what were your feelings after coming out of the first three issues? I expected to be a lot <clears throat> more adult oriented. Okay, racier. Is racier, racier a good term? Yeah, yeah, uh, campier. Man, there's plenty of you know, like I guess you could say, call it camp in there, but not what I expect. Uh, what I was expecting. Yeah, it's not an overabundance, right? Uh, of um, of it. And I didn't expect to see the kind of art that I saw. To be honest with you. Were you impressed? I was somewhat impressed. For a Dark Horse book, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, I, can, I can see where you're coming from. 90s comic, you know, it wasn't any different from any other 90s comic, mm-hmm. really. I mean, um, it had the art that I was, that I've become, uh, that I became accustomed to in a comic book. So that was, I mean, that was really different for me. What'd you think of Barb as a character? Different. A lot stronger of a character than, <laughs> than what the movie presented. Uh, um, more capable, I guess you could say. Okay. Mark Radlich, what what's your thoughts of this first first three issues and your your expectations slash what you got out of uh, out of this first story arc? Well, let me first say that I enjoyed the whole nine issue run, but like Ronnie, I expected um I expected a lot more tits. I expected it to <laughs> expected it to be racier. Not what I said, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, once you once you kind of got over the initial assumption got past your assumptions of what this was going to be especially like i like like you guys i wasn't aware this was a comic first i thought this was just a shitty pamela and this pamela pamela handler pamela i handle them my pamela all the time um <laughs> pamela la, 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 anderson movie I, I guess I assumed that the comic would be more like the movie. It turns out they're really two completely different entities. For, for one thing, this this iteration or barbed wire in the comic is she's not like really any kind of you know she's not really like a sexualized character. Yeah. The only the only thing that's even like remotely sexualized about her is she you know is she's wearing high heels and you know kind of a goofy club outfit. You know, to go hunting bad guys in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, so one might say that's like a superhero costume. Yeah, it's um, no different from what you found in, in X-Men or, or anything else. If but, not right. a little, yeah, yes. if not a little bit tamer. I mean, I would yeah. say it definitely yeah, she was look not like nearly the whore. I was going to say, she doesn't look like nearly the whore some of the other ones look like in, you know, Marvel and DC Comics. <laughs> you know, so, I, so I, I credit them for that. But, like, she's not she's not ditzy. She's not she's not dumb at all. You know, again, if she wasn't wandering around in, in a halter top and you know in a pink jacket she's just there's also like nothing particularly special about her you know she she can beat people up and she's a bounty hunter there's a there's a series of books that my wife really likes the number the volume number of the book is is part of the title so so it'll be like 21 like chapter like volume 21 21 gun salute something like that and it's about a, a bounty hunter you know and again I, I i saw a fair degree of similarities between these these two characters by the way this was also made into a movie that nobody saw you know it's just a girl out there trying to you know capture mostly you know male bail bail jumpers and like it's it's a weird comic because on the one hand she's just doing the thing on the other hand they introduce all these superhero elements that she's like trying to hardcore stay away from she's mm. like she's like yeah that's too much trouble i just want to get the regular bad guys yeah, like and she just wants so, to pay rent and and make money right yeah yeah she, essentially like like skip tracing is supporting her bar which is a true love mm-hmm. like huh not what I expected at all with this comic. Not to say that I didn't like it. I liked it a lot. It was just kind of I had to I had to back away from my preconceived notions of what this was. I thought this was going to be like an over the top. Like I joked around before about Stripperella. I thought it was going to be something more like that. You know, it was like you know, like the sexual content was going to be more upfront, um, and it was going to be like an over the top heavy metal magazine. I know. Are you guys familiar with heavy metal? 
I remember yeah. heavy metal. I thought it was something more like that. It, it's really not though. It's just sort of a weird concept. It's like we're, we're gonna do just an average, you know, we're gonna do like an average bounty hunter in a world full of supervillains that she just won't interact with. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, the only time she gets involved with and uh, super villains is when she has to do that in order to kind of support herself. She doesn't, uh, you can tell when she talks to her contact about, okay, I need some money. I need some, some people to go catch. And he's like, well, Hey, you know where the real money's at? There's these guys, uh, the hurricane max, you know? Yeah. You, you can go get him. And she's like, yeah. And everybody else who's tried to get him as, you know, a, has pretty much been squashed because of the her, the, the, these wind powers that this guy has, but she takes hey, it real, on anyway. Go ahead. Real quick. Uh, the movie I was, referring to was uh one for the money starring katherine heigl oh okay oh i think Ew. i've seen that i think yeah I've seen that, that yeah that's that was supposed to be the beginning of an entire franchise but the movie didn't do very well uh so it, you know they've only made one of them but there's like 30 some odd books <laughs> with this with this stephanie plum character so yeah, uh, your, your takeaways are the same as mine. Came into this thing expecting uh, an oversexualized '90s girl. I mean, you know, she's wearing the tight outfit. Yeah, we'll give her that. But I mean, really, there's nothing like that in the book. It's just her trying to maintain her business. She's trying to maintain the financial stability with this bar. And yes, yeah, she has friends who are superheroes, such as the Machine, and, and such as. Uh, um, the the what was it the bouncer the guy by the name of Frank Fletcher Motorhead which by the way there are definitely some ties to the band Motorhead considering one of the mini series that she stars in is called Ace of Spades which I thought was pretty interesting but uh, I do want to sh- just give a real quick shout out to poor Frank Fletcher who shows up twice in this series which maybe he I don't know. Maybe he's got more appearances throughout the rest of the uh, Dark Horse series, uh, great comics, greatest world series out there. But you know, he shows up in here and he ends up like uh, blowing the wall down accidentally with like whatever telekinetic powers that he has. So he blows the wall down this bar, and Barb's like, you know what? Why don't you take a Why don't you take a vacation and get out of here? So this guy leaves. Two issues. Two issues later, we got all the, this big dust up with the uh, Blitzkrieg guy, and he hears that over the news, and he's like, at the end of issue three, he's like, uh, he hears that, and he's decided to head back to Steel Harbor. And then that's it. We don't see anything else. That's why, at the end of issue three, he's sitting there, and he hears that. That's how they close. Like, his, you know, scary-looking mug going, uh, I, you know, I have, I just remembered someplace I gotta be. And he's walking, he's walking out of this place. And I'm like, oh man, I cannot wait to see what's going to happen now. Him and Blitzkrieg are going to go at it. Doesn't happen in the pages of, of Barb Wire. And I had to go down to the end of the letters page on issue three to where I'll just, you know, it says, join us in two months. We take a break next month as Barb and her Steel Harbor buds will take part in our wild and frenetic will to power crossover. So you actually have to go to another series. Which is common in 90s comics, wouldn't you say, Ronnie Adams? Yes. You, you had to go to another... That was the whole point of a crossover, too, which everybody in the mid-90s, uh, early to mid-90s, was hopping on the crossover bandwagon. If Marvel didn't do something like that with a Spider-Man or an X-Men title every month, you know, the Dark Horse was definitely emulating that, I think, in, in this instance, anyway. That's the only point in this whole series where I think that occurs, but regardless... I was sitting there worried I missed something when we hop into the next part, uh, this next series, uh, or the story arc. So, all right, so issues four and five uh, starts out with the ghost in the machine. Uh, this story mainly focuses on a federal officer, a real shithead by the name of, uh, I think his last name is Creep. I'm going to call him Creep because he's a creep, who apparently he has ties to the origin of Barb's uh, partner, the machine, who is this like cyborg guy. I mean, he can get into computers and you know, apparently has some kind of control over wires, because at one point I think wires come out of a phone and attack a guy and it's all because the machine is controlling him. But before the machine was the machine, he was a regular guy like me and you. He was Avram Roman. <laughs> Creep has some apparent ties to Avram. Uh, when Creep finds Avram, he uses the machine's father, who believes his son to have been dead, to attempt to lure him out. Uh, when he is finally drawn out of the Hammerhead Bar, Creep viciously, viciously attacks, uh, attacks him with similar creations that he's made. Uh, the, the machine is able to best them and escapes, but soon finds, uh, afterwards, he finds Creep's home slash lab and attacks it, begging for Creep to have the other cyborgs kill him. 
However, inside the machine's mind, we see that the machine is a separate entity and will not allow him to give up his life so easily and is trying to take over, but Avram won't let them. So as the machine leaves, Barb shows up and stops Creep from doing more damage. Uh, the end gives us some depth to the character of Avram as Barb pleads with him to talk to his dad. Uh, and Avram has long since decided he would rather his father believe him dead than know the truth of what he has become. Uh, so I did a little bit of research on this character, and yeah, it turns out he was like, just from what they said in issue one, he was a victim of the government <clears throat> installing... Let me read this to you real quick, uh, just so we can have an idea of who Avram Roman is as soon as I get to it. Which I don't know if you guys saw or not, but at the end of like the first issue, there was... <laughs> It was like an introduction to every character in Barbed Wire. It was characters that hadn't even shown up in the in the book yet. But here we go. The Machine. Barb's right hand, well, uh, Machine. Once upon a time, he was one Avram Roman, but is now the victim of a government-imposed self-repair system that replaces humanity with machinery every time it is utilized. With each passing day, Avram becomes less a man and more a machine. So anyway, there's, there's our second story arc. It, it's kind of like a look into Avram Roman uh, and his struggles as he continually battles the machine that's inside his head and, and the machine that he turns into each day. Uh, so, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. What'd you think of this small little story arc? I was very sad for the dad. You know, it's, it's so funny because, like, when you think of Barbed Wire, you, you just think of the movie, right? Yeah. You know, and... And, and it's just in the movie, it's just a bunch of it's a pile of crap. But there was a lot of grist for the mill here. And I don't think this character is in the movie at all. I just checked the credits. I didn't say anything about an Avram. But I mean, you have, you know, this cyborg that's turning into you know, more more machine than man. And he's like, you know, just let my dad think I'm dead. And, you know, and again, barbed wire is not like a, like a ditzy, you know, comical character. She's sitting here struggling with this. It's like, like your dad just seems really sad and I just want to help him. I want him to know the truth. And he's like, you know what? It's none of your business. Stay out of it. I was sad to see him go. You know, like at the end, like he just like takes off on her and she'd become a kind of reliant on him. And he's like, yeah, I gotta go. I gotta, I gotta see a man about a horse and just like splits on her. And I was really sad about that. Yeah. I so I thought all that was interesting. I th- I thought that I thought the bit with the with the uh, apartment was really funny. He's like, you know, the first like here's six thousand dollars. This will cover us for a while. And then <laughs> later on, after they all fight, the, the the landlord's like, you know what? You did a lot more than six thousand dollars worth of damage here. Jesus. Yeah, shit. This man. isn't gonna work at all. Uh, yeah. Well, I didn't know who the hell this guy was. This creep guy. He comes in there and like he brings these people in there and he just starts hacking them with an axe. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? with this dude um there's mention of a, a group of people called the pent agents which i assume has something to do with the pentagon because creep was this you know he was this government agent or federal officer as he that was an interesting part i i think for me personally this was probably one of the nine issues this was probably one of the more poignant stories that kind of like made me think uh you know there's a lot more to this series than i actually gave it credit for going into yeah this, this it's kind of a hidden treasure because again you know, unless you were following Dark Horse comics at the time, you know, it's like, like if I had to just this came out came out and said, "Hey guys, what do you think about doing barbed wire?" I'm sure the reaction would have been like, "Why?" You know, and then like you read like, "Oh, well, this is actually like much better than you would think it is based on the movie that you know was derived from it," which makes me which makes me kind of mad at the people who put that movie together. <laughs> well, I'm you got to think of what they were going for and the, the the audience they were going for with who they cast as well. No, I get that. But there was obviously the the source material eh. yeah. the source material <laughs> is uh is certainly a lot better than what they did with it. Oh absolutely like like the source material deserved better. Well I mean look at the X Men movies and Fantastic Four movies. What about them? Uh, they're terrible. Not all of them. Not not all the X Men movies are bad. Not all the Fantastic Four movies are bad. Have okay. you seen the Have you seen the last one? The last one's a cinematic masterpiece. <laughs> Mark, uh... <laughs> take it back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as we all know, Josh Trank and Fox really hit it out of the park with Fantastic. Um, really nailing the dynamic between all of the characters, and we're able to create a movie which with such uh, vibrant. Uh, lore, oh, you know, they're really, yeah. really mining the lore uh, as best they could. 
So just taking a look here, guys, real quick. You're I'm pushing gonna, it. <laughs> I want to throw this out there. Uh, the machine was in his own comic. So my guess is Abram Roman Jr. took off uh, from Barbed Wire's comic and then starred in his own. I don't know if anybody else had this problem, but every time I read his name, all I did was picture that comedian that tells the story about being in the machine when he was on a college trip to Russia. Uh, I can't remember the, the comedian's name, but all you have to do is type in the machine. Yakov Shmeranov? No, 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 no. We're talking about a good comedian. Um, <laughs> a machine? Common comedian? <laughs> Benny Hill? What is wrong with you? Bert, <laughs> Bert Kresher? Yes. Rip Taylor? Bert Kreischer. What? Are you sure it's not Rip Taylor? He tells a story about... He's, he does not have a shirt on. I no, can see that right does, now. He does most of his stand-up shirts. <laughs> does he That's throw a confetti cool. like Rip Taylor? No. Oh. Yeah. Um, It'd be much funnier if he threw confetti. I'm trying to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> is, it a, is it about Rip Taylor? You know what? Just know that there's a comedian tell, that tells a story about taking a trip to Russia, and he is known uh, in the Russian mob as the machine. Okay. And he's a made man. Okay, I'll remember that. Jesse, yes, did you know that there was a comedian named Rip Taylor who would throw confetti after his jokes? <sighs> Yeah, I kind of picked up on that after the first three times you mentioned it. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. All right. So. What? <laughs> no. <laughs> why would cool. you start sing- Why would know. you start singing on the I, podcast? I don't know. That's ridiculous. we're trying to have a discussion. It's we're try- a, so out of character. <laughs> we're trying to have a discussion about barbed wire, one of the seminal comics of the '90s. So, which which produced an award winning movie. Oh yeah, it it won plenty of awards from what I remember. It, it won at least. Hang on, I want. I, want, now I gotta see how many won. We gotta count it. Because because I was just looking number. at what Pam. I was just looking at what Pam Anderson won, but we didn't look at what barbed wire itself won. Oh boy. You can keep going. I'll just interrupt you. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. All right. Um, By all means. Sir. <laughs> I, Why, ah, sir. here we go. Awards and nominations. Okay. It was nominated for the following Razzies: Worst Picture. Worst actress, <laughs> Pamela Anderson. Worst screen couple, Pamela Anderson's impressive enhancements. Worst screenplay, Chuck uh, Farrer and uh, Eileen Ch- Chaikin. It won for Worst New Star in Pamela Anderson. And Worst Original Song, Welcome to Planet Boom by Tommy Lee, which I hope you came into tonight on this podcast. <laughs> Uh, and then, I have oh, so many jokes I could make right there, just by what you said. <laughs> but go ahead, continue. <laughs> I hope what I what I hope everyone just heard was that you stopped the podcast and inserted a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then 1997, the MTV Movie Awards Best Fight: Pamela Anderson and Steve Rylesback. It was nominated. It was Best Fight. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, aside from that absurdity, um, I. <laughs> I did. I mean, I wanted to point out some the end, the very end of that story arc where uh, she watches this stuff happen between uh, Avram and his dad uh, and his dad, and he, she like gets the just gets the notion to call her dad, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, so she calls her dad, and he's like, "What the hell you want? You know, you never hardly call. It's not a holiday." And he's like, "She's like, well, you know what? I just wanted to call to see if, uh, you know, see if I could come over uh, and hang out with you guys." So, anyway, uh, interesting, again, very interesting, not what I expected in any way, and I, I, again, this, this particular story arc right here really opened my eyes. Uh, aside from this, we're, get, we're about to get into the last four issues of this uh, comic, and these next four have, I think, the biggest oh shit moment of this series uh, for me, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about that as we get to it. But, all right, here we go. Let's get into what I call Ignition Quest, which uh, is a horrible title, but whatever. Uh, So, yes, Ignition, as if you couldn't tell, this is going to be centered around uh, the second embodiment of the villain Ignition. Uh, But we start out with uh, Barb quitting. Yeah, that the, the last... The last bit, or the la- the letters page, or the coming next month uh, on issue five, said that Barb's quitting the the um, skip trace game. And I was like, oh boy, here we go. So anyway, after a run-in with a small criminal, which uh, has to have the worst name ever, uh, by Johnny B. Rude. <laughs> I mean, come on, dude. Uh, after a run-in with a small-time criminal, uh, 
including a potential of getting sued for wrecking the car of a bystander by the name of Dennis O'Neill. Wink, wink. I don't know if you guys picked up on that, but he's a uh, rather prominent comic creator. Uh, so anyway, he, she ends up accidentally wrecking this car of this guy, and she's she's about to be getting sued, and she she runs into some rough times with the people she cares about. Uh, you know, Machine's gone, kind of giving her brother a hard time, Charlie, she's giving him a hard time. I think one of her bartenders quit on her, just leaves. Uh, and so she's just kind of tired of all this, you know, all this crap that she's running into. And she decides she needs to change and kind of focus on her friends at the bar. And uh, so she quits bounty hunting. But the problem is, is that with by quitting that, by quitting a job, you know, you, you run into some problems trying to figure out where your income is going to be coming from. So things financially get tough for Barb as without the skip trace money coming in, she has to start actually taking out loans. And there's a interaction with a real skeezy loan law officer who pretty much solicits uh you know maybe he could approve a few things if she does a few favors for him and hashtag me too (laughs) did you hashtag me too she's she ain't taking none of it man she kicks that guy's Uh, ass and she didn't get her loan no she didn't she didn't give a shit though she was like i'm out (laughs) yeah she's trying to get loans uh loans to try and keep herself keep her in the bar afloat frank fletcher motorhead returns that's right. The guy who left in issue three comes back in uh, issue six or seven, but he's not met with a warm welcome because of this kind of cold shoulder that Barb gives him. Like, you know, he can't just walk back in and have his place. And she's still kind of worried. You know, last time she saw him, he fucking blew down the wall of her uh, uh, bar. He's kind of upset and he leaves. That's kind of the last time we see old Frank Fletcher Motorhead. <laughs> he just it's walks a out. Little, it's a little underwritten. <laughs> it's like a guy shows up and <laughs> she's like, oh, well, you know, I, I don't think I can bring you back on with uh, what's been going on. He's like, oh, okay, well, that doesn't surprise me. And then he leaves. He's gone. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, I don't, th- I don't think you should be here. You're right. <laughs> and just walks away. He's gone. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm a douche. <laughs> So, during this, an old villainous team reunites. Ignition 2 and Hard Hide. So, let's talk about Hard Hide real quick. Mark, what, I mean, can you give our listeners a, uh, your best description of Hard Hide and who this guy is? Yeah, he seems to be an old honky who's made a lizard skin. Yeah, he's got this uh, bullets bounce off of him. He definitely looks like he's been through the ringer. Yeah, he got beat with an ugly stick. He's yeah. So he either just got out of the joint or has just made his way back to to uh, Steel Harbor. And well, whatever he is, he ain't gonna last very long because he's about to have his powers taken away. Yeah, we're gonna have some problems because uh, ignition two. Okay, now remember, <laughs> it was his. It was ignition's crazy girlfriend that got ignition's powers after she killed him. So uh, she's still crazy, and after all these years. Uh, yes, there's a song there in there. They get together. She finds Hard Hide, and they're like, "Hey, why don't we just why don't we we become pals again?" Uh, you know, Ignition and Hard Hide were a team in the past. Ignition talks them into teaming up, and they go back into action, robbing banks and stuff. But it doesn't take long for Hard Hide to tire uh, with the crazy antics of his partner, and he decides he wants out. He's like, "Whoa, wait a second! You're just a little over the top here." He w- there's one point where she's like, "Possibly going to kill some cops." He's like, "No, I didn't sign on for that." So finally, he's like, "Look." I want out of this. I want out of this deal. Now, telling Ignition this, Hard Hide meets an unfortunate end when Ignition spontaneously... I'm going to try and say that again. Spontaneously combusts him, and then surprisingly... I didn't expect Combusts him in the nuts. (laughs) Surprisingly takes his powers. I didn't expect this. I mean, I didn't think that that's what was going on in the beginning. Well, no one expects spontaneous combustion. (laughs) Or the Spanish <laughs> spontaneous. <laughs> or the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, I mean, if if you expect someone to combust, that just means you've set them on fire. So, so there's spontaneous um, combustion and expected combustion. This was spontaneous. So, so Jesse doesn't know what I just said or what or what that means because yet again he doesn't know anything from Monty Python. I have no idea. I don't know how. But, Spanish just Inquisition? Just, n- nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. I don't get it. Fucking no, Brits. Not. Fucking Brits in your humor. Uh, so anyway, uh, yes, Ignition kills... <laughs> Ignition kills Hardhide and then takes his power, which I think that was that was the moment where I was like, oh, okay, this 
this is a different animal here. At first, I thought ignition was like the the force, and like when it got when it ran out of, or when its body got killed. So the the body that was inhabiting before gets killed by that girl, his girlfriend. It just hopped into his girlfriend's body and moved on. That's not the case. It's the girlfriend I think that has the power, which apparently can absorb other people's powers after they kill them. And she figures this out just kind of like the, what the reader does. Because there's a, she's got that gun of, and is like shooting herself in the chest, and she's like, I understand everything now. So I was like, oh, okay. So anyway. Uh, now, Ignition takes a young criminal protege by the name of Nikki along with her and battles her old team. Now, here again, this is one of those situations where I'd rather be, I'd rather know a little bit more about the Dark Horse superhero universe because we have this team that Ignition is from previously called the Prime Movers. She just straight up attacks one of them. Actually, one of the, one of the guys that was defending her in the first place. During the battle, Ignition is outmatched and her and Nikki barely escape with their lives. Nikki explains maybe, maybe Ignition needs to find barbed wire and kill her and take her powers. As it seems, Barb is always quicker and smarter than her competition. Now, up to this point, I'm sure I'm on the same level as you guys. We didn't, ex- I didn't think that barbed wire has any powers. Ronnie? Right. No, I had no clue. Okay. Mark? They start to say, like, her powers are her brains, but she doesn't have any actual, like, metaphysical powers. Okay. Yeah. So Ignition agrees to this and heads to the Hammerhead Bar, but Barb is nowhere to be found. So instead, she takes Barb's brother, Charlie, hostage. Uh, Returning uh, and finding her brother gone, Barb goes to find Ignition and, and Nikki. And they face off in a junk... I think it's a junkyard. During the fray, Barb just straight <coughs> up kills Nikki, who I don't think stood a chance. I don't think Nikki even has any powers, but she's out there running her mouth. And Barb... I think she's trying to shoot at Barb. Barb hops into a crane and just, like, within a panel, this crane <laughs> this crane hook is heading right for Nikki's head and kills her right there. Uh, so Barb, you know, kills somebody. I don't think we see that throughout the whole series right up until this very this very last issue. Uh, so Nikki doesn't stand a chance. She's dead. Finally, Barb and Ignition get to battle. As Ignition appears to get the upper hand, uh, Charlie is able to let Barb know about Ignition's weakness to electricity. Barb is able to rewire a cattle prod to finally bring her down. So that's the end of the battle. And at the end of this, we kind of have the, the, the wrap-up where Barb lets Charlie know, hey, look, I appreciate your work and what you do for me and what you've done for the bar and all this and blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of where we leave it. That's the end of this nine-issue series. She doesn't kill Ignition. Ignition is still alive. Like, some government agency shows up. This robot's taking Ignition away to some kind of crazy, probably super-powered prison. Uh, And then that's it. So here we are. We've reached the end of this. Mark Radlich, what did you think of the series as a whole? What did you think of this story arc? Anything you'd like to say that's left unsaid? Um, Look, I really liked it. As we said before, I don't want to beat this horse to death, but it was different than what I expected going in. Here's the thing, and I said this to you offline. There's nothing groundbreaking about it. It's not special. It just it just kind of is. It seems like it's a more PG-13 chick version of the Punisher. And you know, the Punisher but with like with even less direction. You know, like the Pun- the Punisher was at least out for revenge. She's out for a paycheck. And again, that's why I compared it to like one for the money. She's just a girl in the world doing a thing, you know, trying to pay some rent. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's that's fine. And it was, you know, and it was an entertaining read. I, I don't know if this will stick with me beyond its connection to the really shitty and by shitty I mean fantastic movie. <laughs> well, there's one thing you could say. You've read all nine issues of Barbed Wire, which is something you couldn't say a few days back. I mean, it's not like a really important piece of comic book history we have in our hands. So you're right on that aspect. But, you know, and we're going to talk about this because I want to read this letter from issue six. And it's specifically discussing Barbed Wire and her being a female, you know, a female superhero. Uh, and whether that's a good thing, bad thing, whatever. We'll, we'll talk as we go through the letter because I didn't read all of it, but I, I, I saw a little bit of it. And I think it's, it's worth talking about. Anything else there, Mark? Nope, I'm good. All right, Ronnie Adams, what do you Not think? Not enough tits. <laughs> Not enough tits. Do you want... Like I said, we need to go to Image Comics if you want some of that, buddy. We can get plenty of that over there from the 90s. Ronnie Adams, what do you think of Barbed Wire? Nine issues, bro. Surprising. Yeah? I was not expecting what I got. It was it was a good read. I mean, and I'll echo Mark a little bit by saying it wasn't anything really special. I'm really not sure why they even chose to make a movie out of it, other than the fact that it, you know, it has a dynamic female lead in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... It's it's funny that 
uh, Mark went Punisher. I actually went Paladin from Marvel Comics. Okay. She has sort of the same comic, I mean, the costume scheme, you know, purple and red, you know, whatever. Yeah. And he's just, you know, he's a gun for hire. Like, literally, that's it. Gun for hire, you know, I'll hunt somebody down, kill him or whatever for money. But it was it was it was a surprising ring. But as like I told you all, I was a little worried that it was going to be adult oriented. You know, I read on my lunch breaks and, and different things like that at, at work or you know at home or you know waiting for an oil change or whatever. I, I really didn't want anybody to see me reading this at first because <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to get. But it was actually it, it wasn't a bad read, and, and it's it's a shame what they did to it with the movie. You know, while it's not anything like incredibly you know world shattering or, or or dynamic or anything like that it deserved a lot better than what it got yeah um, as far as as far as the movie goes it's it's not a bad read i mean like if you're if you're looking to 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 branch out a little bit uh from the you know the big two or the big three i guess you could say with with image you no know, this is pretty good you know if you're looking for something different i guess i would recommend it you know it's it's a comic that definitely takes place in a comic book universe uh this isn't something that you know this is Early 90s, going, going, getting close to the mid-90s, it seems like every comic publisher that was popping up then had grand ideas to start at a universe very similar to Marvel or D- DC. Yeah. So with Barb Wire, I think one of its weaknesses in the nine issues is probably a, a strength if you were talking about it back in the 90s where they wanted to establish that, hey, we have other characters and they kind of pop up in your book and then they go away. But now we're sitting in, you know, 20, close to 25 years later now. Yeah, it is. Tw- uh, yes, yeah, close to 25 years later. You, you're you looking at this like, oh, man, if we would have just focused on Barb a little bit more, if we would have just because yeah. it, it felt like, OK, well, hey, we're talking about uh, Frank Fletcher over here or here's the machine. And we really don't have the one defining story arc of hers is her going up against ignition. And really, that's it. The whole Max going after Death Card. Death Card gets away. I mean, you don't see him ever again. He probably pops up in other books. So really, her her, her defining moment is her battle with Ignition, where she gets to rely kind of on her speed and agility and brains to get out of a jam. It's not setting the world on fire. It's it, and it's amazing that it really. I, it, it's amazing to me that it got a movie, <laughs> uh, yeah. as well, because there there's only a, when you're talking early '90s, dude. What comics were hitting the big screen at that point in time? You know, the, other than some of the stuff that uh, the mid '90s, I, th- I don't think we get really Blade until what '98, '99, somewhere around there. Something like that, yeah. Or 2000, maybe I don't know, but that's that's kind of where the Marvel universe, or at least Marvel comics, I think, get their start. So here we have a comic or a movie that's based off of an independent comic. Now there were a few out there, I'm sure, but again. You know, if you said barbed wire and back in the 90s, I was scratching my head like, OK, we can't have, you know, we can't have one of the other more female led protagonist books from Marvel or DC, which maybe there wasn't too many at the time. Uh, I don't know if there was very many in the 90s uh, with uh, that were female led books. For some reason, I'm trying to think off the top of my head what 90s Marvel comic featured a female She-Hulk. She-Hulk yeah. would probably be a good one. You know, all the special effects that you had to put forth in the 90s for a movie like that, that's not going to happen. Barb wire is simple, you know, so she's she's simple. You, she, she's riding a bike. She wears tight pants. Doesn't even, You don't even have to pay for the wardrobe for a shirt, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Just give her a tooth I mean, off. Literally, or I remember watching that movie and sh- they had her clothes off within the first forty-five seconds. <laughs> Mark, are you are you awake? Yeah. All right, we're gonna we are going to go. I'm gonna read. So so pinch yourself like every ten seconds so you can stay awake here. All right. I, I just want to see what you guys think about this, and and, and yeah. we'll we'll kind of run through this real quick, and then we'll you're talking it. about the Watchmen. You're talking about the Watchmen, right? <laughs> v for Vendetta. Uh, so all right dear editor m hey come on i read a letters page to find out about comics not to see them slandered barbed wire number two how can you say there has been an utter lack of truly strong female characters comic now remember this is 90 94 comics have been way ahead of other entertainment media in portraying truly strong female characters and this tradition goes back to 1939 and maybe earlier unattractive superheroines what comics have you been reading i can't think of a single prominent female comic book character that isn't a dead knockout do they have to be rescued by male characters sometimes 
sometimes, but they do their share of rescuing as well. Besides, if needing an occasional rescue is a sign of weakness, barbed wire isn't very strong. In three issues, men have rescued her four times. The machine rescued her at the party house, Motorhead rescued her from a burst of automatic rifle fire, Hurricane Max rescued her from Death Card, and the machine and Alonzo rescued her from the rubble Hurricane Max had trapped her in. You may think that this shows she isn't truly strong. I think it just shows that one can be strong and still not be invincible. I think it's a good thing for women to be portrayed as being as competent as men. I think the comics industry, including Dark Horse's contributions, deserves praise for its traditional dedication to this. If Wires to Barb is going to be a forum for overstated sociology, let's at least give credit where credit's due. Better yet, let's keep the letters page for letters about comics. So, okay. Mark Radlitz... Do you Sir. think okay you're you're going to put put your brain to work here do you think Barb Wire is a very strong female character and if so give some examples even though she was rescued four to five times throughout the comic all right so let's say at the height of female empowerment is Captain Marvel and just below that is Atana and at the bottom gosh I don't know who would be at the bottom Ronnie <sighs> Mary Jane Watson. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll say Aunt May. Aunt May. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> I was hoping for somebody deserved. hotter, but okay, Aunt May. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say we, the. I didn't say like, fuckable. I meant <laughs> Spider Man Homecoming, Aunt May, or comic book Aunt May. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of somebody that really relies on like Pepper Potts, but she's pretty strong. She, just, I mean, she was a she was a hero in her own right. Yeah, she was. What was her Ironheart or whatever uh, her name is? No, Rescue. Uh, Rescue. Rescue. Thank you. So I don't know. It's tough because there's there's quite a few uh, ladies who, even though you may think they may not do much, you comics have portrayed them differently. But okay, we'll go with Aunt May. But go ahead, Mark. Finish Let, your point. Let's go with let's go with uh, modern age and, and like golden age. Uh, I, you're gonna break my break my brain. What, okay, never mind. I did not say anything. Are you saying modern age women compared right. to golden age women? You you would you would you would say, you would know that. I mean, like today, Wonder Woman is one of the strongest women in comics. Oh yes. Okay. Um, she's a positive role model for for girls everywhere. But also, in you know when she when her comic book was newer, there was a lot of. Uh, how can I put this? Um, there were a lot of instances where she was tr- <laughs> uh, she was turned over a villain's knee and spanked. Ah, yes. Yep. She was told that women's place was in the kitchen or whatever. Uh, she was told she wasn't pretty, so that that was you know that caused her to. <laughs> and and so Wonder herself. Woman was canceled. Right. <laughs> I've, well, I've got a perfect example. Eighties Janet Van Dyne. Okay. That's, you know, we read Secret Wars, and she's, like, worried about her fucking hair throughout she that. Was... She, there was a comb. Dr. Doom tricked her into coming over there by, like... Magneto. Magneto. Was it Magneto? Uh, giving her like, Magneto. Yeah, that's right. It was Magneto. Give her, giving her a fucking comb and a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> that's some bad shit so we're gonna say we're gonna say 80s janet van dyne and absolutely uh, 60s sue storm yeah okay there we yeah, go yeah there, we'll, we'll call them the bottom so anyway mark radlich finish your point i would say she's probably about mid-range about a, about a five because again you know she i don't know I, I may maybe a little bit higher uh but i feel like she it was definitely very reliant on the machine. Like when he left, she knew she she knew she was super vulnerable. You know, she like the one time like she goes after a uh, like she's supposed to be a professional bounty hunter, and like the one and she quits like almost as soon as she has one kind of botched attempt at a skip at a skip trace, and the machine isn't there to back her up. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, she's, you know, for a regular human, just, just a regular old Humie, she's pretty, you know, pretty, pretty powerful. She kicks, she can kick a bit of ass. I think, I think if you, if the message you're trying to tell, you know, little girls, or whatever, is you can be pretty and kick ass at the same time, I think she does a pretty okay job of it. She succeeds, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be against giving Lily this, this series for her to read. Though Lily would then hand it back to me and say, I said spider grand motherfucker. <laughs> You talk a little about her language. 
<laughs> no, no, my daughter doesn't curse. My 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 daughter actually gets on me about cursing. Like I put podcasts on in the car or whatever. She's like, can we turn off the cursing? All they say is bad language. Never, <laughs> never, never. All right, Ronnie. Anything else you'd like to add to that? You said she owns her own business. Kick off of that real quick. She she owns uh, not only her own business but she owns two businesses. Um, skip tracing and and a bar. Yeah. That are predominantly male. You know, male owned business. That's true. All right. Well, this has been our coverage of Barbed Wire. We have read nine issues of a 1994 comic. Uh, I was very pleased and uh, glad we had the opportunity to talk about it tonight. So let's get into plugs. Mark Radulich, what is going on on the Radulich in Broadcasting Network? All right. Tomorrow night on the Radulich and Broadcasting Network is our on trial for the Pamela Anderson award nominated movie Barbed Wire. Listen, <sighs> you can't say it's award nominated just because it, it's, it's award nominated, nominated, Ronnie. And you can't dis- you can't awards. disprove it. <laughs> it's look, you're being very specific, and I feel like you hate women. Um, I'm trying <laughs> to talk. <laughs> Things took a turn. <laughs> what a twist! <laughs> Uh, aren't you aren't you glad I woke up? Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, let's see what are we doing on the Middle Hammer of Doom this week? Okay, Jesse, what's next? Uh, Bolt from my Valentine, new album, Gravity. Uh, we'll have a whole bunch of Metal Hammer of Doom extras for you, and then the review of Gravity by Bullet for My Valentine. Last week, uh, we had a bunch of content drop. We had uh, our sh- our Legion, our X-Men Legacy show here on Source Material, and then Fufu the Snoo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, could read, you could be reading a hut zut or something like that. I don't know <laughs> what that was. <laughs> You could play a hut zut <laughs> if, if you learn to read with your eyes shut. Um, anyway, we <laughs> it means nothing to me. <laughs> so Jesse and I, uh, we did a TV party tonight for Legion season two. Uh, we talked for an hour. We still don't know what that show was all about. And then on then uh, nothing just... will be, nothing will be decided. <laughs> we will have no resolution for you. Tune in for absolute confusion. It's an hour. <laughs> it's an hour of me and Jesse going. Did you understand what happened? Because I sure the fuck didn't. Uh, with that that being said, then we reviewed the new Alice in Chains album, Rainier Fog. Next week on the Rattled and Broadcasting Network, it's the show Ronnie has been waiting all year for. Lady, when I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, what a pain in the ass Ronnie Adams has been about this. It's every week. When are we doing Snagapus? When are we doing Snagapus? The Snagapus Chronicles, guys. I'm Ronnie Adams from the Screaming Boy podcast, Snagapus. <laughs> he we he at one point thought about re- changing the name of his podcast to the Snagopus uh, podcast. How does it feel to know that you lie? <laughs> so much. Don't know what you're talking about. Um. Anyway, we what we're you finally asking about that stupid book <laughs> is so I can pretend to be sick that night. <laughs> anyway, Ronnie Adams' dreams are finally coming true. We are go- we are going to review the Snagopus Chronicles. So. That's coming for your ass right there. And, speak, and speaking of... <laughs> no comment. <laughs> speaking of your ass, um, we got a TV party... Mark talks for... out of his a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we got a TV party for the Freeform uh, series Cloak and Dagger. Jesse and I will finally get around to talking about that. I kind of know what happened on that one. That was less confusing than Legion. Mm. But not by much. Um, and then finally, here in the Metal Hammer of Doom, it's the one we've all been waiting for. It's what it's all been leading up to. Finally, all the secrets will be revealed in the Book of Bad Decisions by Clutch. And then just for shits and giggles, Sean Comer, myself, and some broads will be talking Insatiable Season 1. And uh, lest I forget, we threw up an extra TV party tonight for Disenchantment. With a uh, Canadian fan, uh, fan of the show, David Wright, and a special appearance by Simpson fanatic uh, Robert Winfrey. Ooh, so that's what. That's nice. I so, forgot Winfrey's name for a second. He's got uh, too many uh, Roberts on podcasts. That's yeah. True. Um, I, I, two minutes ago, I was snoring. <laughs> um, give me a break. <laughs> Uh, we've got a whole bunch of shows for the Predator series. We've got Iron Fist coming up. We've got Ozarks. We've got Inzarks. We've got Aardvarks. Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Ronnie Adams of the Screaming Boy Podcast, please. My name is Ronnie Adams, and I have a show called the Screaming Boy Podcast. Uh, we've been on a slight hiatus as of late, other than putting out uh, network-exclusive shows. Uh, we are set to begin again here very, very soon. 
we're excited about that. But you can go back and listen to all of our shows uh, on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, and right here on the Radulich and Broadcasting Network. They're a lot of fun. It's a nerd culture, pop culture show that will absolutely rock your socks off. The last one we did was uh, was entitled The Day Laughter Died, and it's about the firing of one James Gunn. And now, uh, from the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, movies, and now um, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 has been put on hold. So we don't know if we're going to get to see that or not. Yeah. So maybe they're just doing it until this all this controversy dies down. So let's hope that's, that's the... Uh, uh, that's what's going on, and we get to see another James Gunn classic with uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. But with that, I'm going to say check us out on any of the social media that's out there. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the whole nine. We're on there. Please just look us up, find us, you know, hit like, subscribe, follow us, whatever you want to do, whatever your whatever tickles your fancy, and uh, we'll give you a follow back and we'll say hello. I'm also uh, attending a, a couple more conventions coming up. Uh, the Greensboro Comic Con and Fayetteville Comic Con, uh, which is going to be very interesting to say the least. Uh, Greensboro, this is its second year, so they are upping their game. Uh, it's a it's a lot of fun. It's a good con. They're very organized. I've really enjoyed it uh, for its first year. Uh, Fayetteville is another one where uh, I will actually get to meet uh, the horror icon Tony Todd and um, Tom Savini, who is uh, who has done you know a lot of special makeup effects on a lot of for Friday special the Special effects, yeah, and directed the remake of uh, Night of the Living Dead, uh, which actually starred Mr. Todd. And um, so I'm super super excited about that. And I'll be posting a lot of pictures with a lot of cosplay and uh, different things like that that uh, you know keep in touch with us uh, we're going to be boasting a lot on, on a lot of pictures and a lot of updates alright very good well ladies and gentlemen that concludes source material we will be talking to you soon have a good one bye bye that brings this episode of source material to a close thank you all for joining us make sure to give that Rattlich in broadcasting Facebook page a like to stay up on top of all the great podcasts we have to offer we are at home on Spreaker but you can also find us on iTunes Stitcher TuneIn Radio and recently we have hit the air on Spotify find your favorite podcast platform and type in R-A-D-U-L-I-C-H to subscribe for some great content if you enjoyed this show please feel free to share and spread the word and as always we appreciate any feedback and look forward to entertaining you again soon. Boys, I'm ready to podcast. <laughs> Is your mic in your butt? Yes. Is your mic in the chips? <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? Try talking closer to your iPad. Put I'll... your iPad in your mouth. <laughs> my iPad is in my butt. Uh, Aquaman bought... <laughs> <laughs> Spell that one, dear, DC. Dear God, man. <laughs> oh, man, the search for hair. Why am I a part of this? Avram, oh crap, what was his name? Uh, Avram Levine. I know. <laughs> Avram... He was a skater boy. <laughs> Just looking to see what his appearances were. Somebody help me out here. Watchmen. <laughs> Shut up, Mark. <laughs> My, some might say her name is Remixed to Ignition. Oh! That she's hot and fresh out the kitchen. Hot and fresh out the kitchen. That's an R. Kelly song, Mark Radlich, I think. I don't listen to R. Kelly. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't listen to I don't listen to things where people pee on other people. There it is. Speaking of urination, check out Tuesday's episode of Source Material. <laughs> <laughs> Ignition 2, Electric Boogaloo, and Hard Hide. <laughs> uh, you know, I can be your bodyguard. You can be my long lost pal. And. You call me out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't sing it. I didn't uh, sing it. I didn't sing it. <laughs> <laughs>
ha- hashtag me too, okay, Jesse? Yep. I don't think that means what you think it means. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to stay awake. It was tough. I mean, my goodness. Why, did I start snoring? No, you didn't start snoring. I just want to make sure you're there. She owns her own business. Wildly, I mean, like, I oh, would he's say. Asleep. Mark Radlich, wake up. <laughs> Sir. Mark. <laughs> Now you started snoring. I'm sorry. Did I really snore? You did, sir. Oh, yeah. No, don't you worry. <laughs> That's a good one.